Yo, this is Jim Heiss. Today I'm with Future Music and we are going over my track Pillager, which came out on Sumo Beats. And yeah, I'm going to take you through it. So yeah, this is Pillager. Um, ooh, creaky chair. Um, yeah, quick kind of weekend tune this was. Um, I think I was playing for Warning in Cambridge when I made this. Well, just before, and uh, I wanted something to play out, something new. And I knew I could make something, so just had a go. This all kind of started with um, this ensemble of Contact. Very simple, I was just going on the, I was just using the keys which don't seem to be working at the moment, my moment. Okay, so I can't even find where the keys are actually playing from, but here. For me, this just screams like inspiration from people like Dillinger, who used to use kind of vocal sounds that were just all messed up. <laughs> no, I was just going through this stuff, basically. And I was thinking, like, how could I, could I, could I use this to start? Could I use this to actually get going on something? And um, yeah, so I needed to build a beat. And the next thing I do, did was like, just start a beat. I had that in my mind that I wanted to use the zombies. So beat-wise, I used Machine to create um, some groups, which unfortunately is not running anymore. Let's just have a little look and see what we've got though. So we've got a kick. So I basically use Machine to find the samples. I use it, <coughs> you can see it right here. Um, I use it to get a result real quick. So in the sense that I can just get the sounds I want, put them on the right pads and, and create just a result every single time. It just worked, the workflow for me um, is perfect. I actually teach people Machine um, pretty much every day. So. We started with a kick. Let's have a listen to that. Okay, so the kick. Has not got anything on it. That was simply just a good sample, basically. And when I find kicks, when I to get that kick, I probably went through eight different kicks that I liked. And then selected through trial of, you know, el elimination process, which one I felt was the best after I'd selected eight. Um, and that's the best way I find to get a result. Find a load of stuff you like, put it, put it on eight pads and then synthesize it and go through each one until you find which you think is the best. And that's just an EDM kick, I think. Probably a vengeance kick from some vengeance EDM pack. Um, it sounds like it, but it's very tight. And I find with the vengeance stuff, you need to tighten it up. You can't, for drum and bass, everything needs to sit in the right place. So you can't just, have it as it is most of the time because a lot of EDM stuff, especially like dubstep um, packs and things like that, their transients are longer because the, s the music's slower. So when you think about it logically, you have to kind of make it a little bit tighter. So I've used Machine to do that, but unfortunately Machine is, is uh, redundant for this track because I've, I've not used it at this point. I've got everything out of Machine at this point, do you know what I mean? Um, so the kick hasn't got anything on it. The snare has got some stuff on it though. Get the uh, mixer up here for a second. But yeah, I don't, I don't actually tend to put much on my kicks, even if, you know, even if this wasn't the case and we weren't looking at this tune. Sometimes I put a bit of tape saturation on a kick, but I find if you choose the right sample, you don't really need to put anything on it if you find the right sample. And they're out there, do you know what I mean? High passing kicks for the sub, um, I don't really do that ever. I tend to I tend to use a side chain if I find the subs being bothered by my kick and just duck it out a little bit with the same imprint of the kick that I'm using. So I'd make a ghost kick and the, and the signal going through would be exactly the same. So it would be ducking the compressor the same. And then uh, that way I always find I don't need to do uh, a, a low cut on the kicks. I really uh, only do that if I think there's some actual rubbish there that I really don't want, but most of the time I wouldn't choose a sample like that anyway, so... <coughs> Snare-wise, we've got uh, some processing going on. And we've got 
some EQ going on, I think. Yep. Okay, so we've got an SPL transient designer. I like this plugin. And that's doing some shaping of the of the snare. If I turn it off, it's really kind of subtle. It's going to be difficult to detect, but basically, I'm using the transient attack uh, knob to just, you know, just ease that. If I make it a little bit more obvious, there you go. So now that's too much. Like what we had was this. So it's not. It's a very powerful tool, the transient designer, and I see people talk about it very loosely, and like they don't know what they're talking about, actually, um, putting it on like a compressor. It's not the same thing. Uh, it can appear like it sounds the same thing, but actually it's just, it's just shaping the, the sound a little bit, the start and the letting it go on a little bit longer. If you, if, you, if you adjusted the sustain, obviously that's going to make it travel a little bit longer like this. Okay. And sometimes it sounds good, sometimes it doesn't. But in this case, I've just used it to kind of smooth the initial transient of the snare to make it a little bit more comfortable in my ear. And then I've used an Aphex Vintage Old Exciter, which is just adding clarity, I think. Let's have a look. It's... Yeah. So that's just adding a little bit of top end kind of um, boost. Um, real, what I'm doing here is I'm sort of driving the input, so I'm getting the processing going on here and I'm, I'm mixing the process and then I'm taking the output down because obviously that would be louder if it was going in like that and not adjusted here. So, you know, gain staging your plugins really important um, and to, to achieve the right use of the plugin as well. And that's subtle, but the big subtle differences, sorry, the small subtle differences make the big picture. All right, so that's what I did. That's what I put on the snare. Let's just listen to the kick and snare on their own. No processing on the snare, and then I can just take them both off there if I want. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Still, that would be exactly what I do right now, even though I made this tune uh, not recently. Um, I do use a spectrum analyzer. My preferred analyzer is the Paz, um, but yeah, I do do it by ear as well. It's no, it's, it's not good to just look at things and think, oh, it should look like this. You know, don't do that. Um, use your ears. Use an analyzer that's secondary. Don't don't kind of uh, set your heart and soul on it. I used to do that, and your mixes will just end up sounding very transparent and um, can sound very unnatural just because you're looking at something and thinking it's got to look like something you know you look at someone else's track and you think oh I'm going to try and get it to look like it doesn't work like that although it may appear it does so kick snare sounds like that basically and then we just got um, what's this okay so we've got a shuffle thing yeah oh no it's another snare so this is like the ghost snare uh, what's going on on this not a lot Again, just the right sample. If I turn that off, all that's doing is giving it some uh, st stereo image information, making it a little bit wider. Um, yeah, not a big deal. Uh, big up Boz, Digital Labs. He's a great guy, makes some really good plugins. Everyone should check him out. Um, basically, this is just giving it a little bit of width. If I turn that, if I bar bypass it, you can even see it there. And I say, don't, don't just concentrate on that, listen to the sound, but. That's a nice little aid as well to see what you're actually getting. I can hear it's different. Um, also in the pads, if I get the pads open. There you go, so if I click L and R, that actually gives me a readout of what the because you can see here the stereo image, but you can also see on the analyzer frequency scale where the stereo image is actually happening. So you can see that there's a slight kind of bit of stereo image going on here, but really it's actually all about down here where the action's happening. You can see there's different you know, frequencies being imprinted there, and that is telling you that that's more stereo frequency there than there is up here. 
This is also a good indication as well. Yeah, pads is wicked. Great plugin. Let's just put it over there. In fact, let's just turn it off. Um, so yeah, just uh, that that added to that snare. If you take it away, the snare's just lost a little bit of presence. See what I mean? And obviously that's giving it the weight. Um, cool. Let's move on to the next little element. Um, okay. Three layers to my snare in this tune if I put them all in together. So this last one's a clap. And we've got a reverb on that. Let's turn the others off. I've a great plugin, use it. Used to use it a lot. Don't use it so much these days, but still very useful. Um, dry wet of 15. Probably usually starts um, completely usually starts completely wet, obviously, um, when you start this plugin up, so it's always worth bearing in mind. You know, if you were gonna use it like a send, you would have it all the way up, but I'm using it on an insert, so I'm, my dry wet is here, and it's not on a send channel. Um, yeah, low cut on the reverb, don't want any of that really coming through from the snare, just looking for the sort of high end refractions, and yeah, just a little bit of dampening on the high end. Um, size is small, the time is small. It's a small reverb. Turn it off. It just puts the clap in its place. Quite a difference about it. But definitely couldn't function on its own. I think that's all of the clap and snares and things that we've got that's actually doing the uh, snare now. Hi hat. My mouse mat's nearly falling off. Um, what's going on with these? Again, just a reverb, no compression or anything. It's simple, kind of hi hat really. Just uh, give the track some. Just give it something <laughs> to actually move to, you know. Let's turn the reverb off. Okay. So again, the reverb's just putting it in its place. Just for me personally, that's what I like. The reverb is a very small mix of three. Um, we've got pre-delay of 50 going on, so that means that the reverb signal is actually happening probably 50 milliseconds uh, after the actual original source material. And then we've got you know, the reverb uh, time and the tr traditional reverb settings, some low cut. Um, yeah, you can see on the screen. And that's just giving me that. If I wanted to, I can get the wet only signal as well, which is quite useful. Let's just home in on that again. Okay, so that's the wet signal I'm actually adding to the dry. Not very much at all, but it makes a difference. Like I say, subtle things can make the difference. Um, then there was another section of hi-hats, I think. Okay, so open hat now, um, ride specifically. And we're using a different reverb this time, using a Waves True reverb, Let's turn it off, yeah, so just adding dimension, I just happened to want to change I think and try a different reverb out but that definitely did the job, all of the parameters are here, you know, traditional things, dimension, room size, decay time, it's pretty short, I think that's pretty much it for the sort of fundamental drums, to be honest. Um, pretty simple, not a lot of plugins, not a lot of processing, and the stuff I actually did in the machine was was not, there was nothing, I can tell you right now, hand on heart, there was nothing. I don't do any processing machine, I just use that to select the samples. Um, I find it just the best way to select stuff, rather than getting audio and trying to do it like that machine is just a nice way of, like I say, presenting stuff and getting a workflow going, so I really recommend it. Um, oh, I have got machine here actually, let's have a little quick look what's actually in there. Couldn't see it, I've just seen it right at the top. Yes, yeah, okay, so it's machine one. Um, there's no actual, yeah, it's, it's just a basic one with no samples in it or anything. Um, like I say, 
I would have kind of exported the sounds out machine, but machine is basically like a notepad for me for beats. Okay. Now there was some processing, additional processing that went on the drums as a whole. Um, let me just check these guys aren't on there because these are additional kind of shuffles that come in later on that we need to look at. Okay, no, they're not on there. So there's a drum bus. Um, a very simple process. Again, it's not complicated, I'm sure. People are going to look at it and sort of say, oh, yeah, I do some sort of thing. Um, I've only got two plugins on it. So all of, the, all of these beats are being run to this beats bus here. Oh, if I solo the beats. There we go. And I'm running, let's get, the, uh, let's get rid of the, this guy. Okay, so, glue plugin is on the bus. Very simple, let's have a listen to it with and without. I'm gonna bypass it here. So that's just, for me, it's just lifting the whole kind of dynamics, squashing the kick snare a little bit, bringing up the small bits in between the shuffles and groove and just making it just sound a little bit more, more coherent, really. Uh, very simple. And then the mix, virtual mix rack, um, this is a really cool plugin called Revival. It's only got two parameters on it, so it's got shimmer and thickness. and I use this just for little light kind of clarity work, um, adding little sparkles to stuff. Sometimes to drive the low mids as well, or the bottom end of something, maybe some bass, but more for this guy. Let's just have a listen to with and without it. That's without it. Yeah, just kind of simple stuff. Um, something you could probably try and do with an EQ and get wrong very easily. I find it just very intuitive just to turn that little guy up a little bit and to see how it sounds. I mean, if I overdid it a little bit. There you go. So not very desirable. Much nicer down there. Less is more with these plugins. Don't try driving them. Some some plugins you need to drive, but not this one. Okay, um, and that's it. That's my mix bus, um, just for the drums. Do you know what I mean? The drums bus, sorry, not the mix bus. Um, very simple. No kind of EQing going on or anything that shouldn't even be turned on. But yeah, I've, I'm happy with those beats. They sound all right. Um, so then, really, once I had the beat in place and I knew that that was what I was gonna use for the track, I started thinking, okay, how am I going to sort of start to get the zombies integrated into it? So I had to create some sort of cinematics. Um, and I love doing cinematics. It's something I uh, just enjoy doing sometimes with no beats at all, but very rarely actually record anything. Oh, it's good to be creative and not ever, actually ever record it. Um, don't do that. So I got a, looks like a trill sample here. So that's uh, that's a sample basically. There was a, a synth that was making that, or it might have been a contact ensemble, but I bounced it, and basically that is just just the sort of intro to the track, really. If I uh, put that with the zombies, I think I used a delay just to, it's basically just a pitch shifting delay that's on that sound. Um, let's just have a look. Yeah, Discorg, great plugin. And it's actually set on a send, so I need to go into my sends quickly. Uh, there it is. Cool. So that's the plugin I use, although I bounce that in audio. Um, that's that's what actually what it looks like. It's just a, a very basic um, pitch shifting delay with left and right. And you can do slightly different things to each side. 
uh, delay times, feedback, uh, the way it crosses over, and the, the lows and the highs as well, and also the shape here. That's why it's sounding a little bit like it trails off. <laughs> See what I mean? So that's basically a bleep, and then it's got this crazy kind of effect from the Discord doing its job as well, bounced into the audio. Um, just so that I retained, I think I did that, and I don't like to commit to stuff, but I had to do it this time because um, I found that it was sometimes having artifacts that were undesired. So I bounced the whole thing and uh, got a good take of it. Plugins will do that to you sometimes, so just try and, you know, export whenever you can, if it starts doing that, just export. And then we've got this grunge sample. So that's just a layer with some, um, has it got any processing? No processing on it. No, it's just a, a layered sound that I found. Probably put it into contact. Yeah, put it into contact here and then uh, just exported it on the key I wanted. Cool. Is there any EQ on that? No EQ, nothing. Just found the right sound. Yep, nothing at all. And then, um, that's pretty much the intro, I think, except for this guy down here, which looks like an effect. Let's have a look, look. Okay, so kind of a an impact there, that's contact. And I'm using, I actually called it the pillagers. I think when I made this, uh, must, have Im must have improvised on this uh, guy here at some point, pillagers look it's called. It's uh, basically just a, a drum sound I think with some reverb on it. Yeah, can't actually see. Maybe it's just a maybe, oh, it's a long release, so quite a long release time on it. No attack, um, and you've got all these other guys. You can turn on phases, and you know I don't really stereo what stereo wide enough. Yeah, it didn't really appeal to me. Sometimes those little buttons on contact work. Sometimes they don't. Try them out. That's what I always try to do anyway. Um, yeah, and that's just that little impact sound at the start of the. No, these, these zombie sounds are pretty sinister. Let's have a look, little look at the actual ensemble for this. Okay, so we've got... They're pretty, they're pretty crazy. I admit, I'm probably a bit messed up in the head. Um, <laughs> I listened back to it, but at the time it provided comedy and just got me writing a tune, so that's all I cared about. Um, yeah, use that inspiration as well. If that's what it takes to get something done, that's what I always, that's what I always say. Um, we are doing a little bit of processing on it just with a delay unit. Let's give it a contact. So just a real simple Cubase delay. I'll turn it off. There, it's, it's gone already. I'll just stop the tune. You can see it's just a quarter note on a, a dotted quarter note with quite relatively high feedback 47.5. Um, not a lot of low cut because the sound doesn't need it, it's pretty low cut already. Um, with the with the top end, I think it's at yeah, 15k. Spatial is to do with how it pans left and right. So if you had that at 50%, then that would be sort of the basic kind of. I, I wanted to draw that in a little bit, and I brought it down to 30 on the space. And then mix is just at 50%, and it just just gives it that ghostly little kind of echo that I, that I like. And makes the sound travel without it, it's just dead, you know. Yeah, right. Okay, so we've just had a look at the uh, 
the zombies. That's uh, that's basically the, all the intro. All the all the intro is just the impact, the impact, and then the zombies with these two samples, and then the drums kick in here. And it was a quick intro, it wasn't like I was trying to reinvent the wheel or anything. It's a weekend tune for me, this one, you know? Right at the end of the transition of the intro, I've got, I've got a couple of little things here. Um, that are doing some sounds, let's have a little listen to these. Okay, so that is a sample I found. Uh, looks like some kind of build-up that's probably not supposed to be drum and bass speed, um, but I I pitch shifted it in time, I think in Ableton actually, um, at an earlier date, and then just put it in there, and it sounded pretty good. I don't think there's any processing on Oh, no, there is. So I've used my Paperboy reverb setting on this. Paperboy was a track I made probably about 2012, and I made a few. I, I, I basically just saved a few of the presets um, that I made certain sounds with, like Paperboy had a few bass lines and, and also a vocal. So I saved the reverb preset for it because I liked it. I thought it was a bit different. Um, let's have a little listen without it and with it. That's with it. So it's a very kind of slight colorization, really, with that reverb. The pre-delay is quite lazy, though. It's set at 92. Um, don't know why it's exactly 92, but uh, yeah, just seemed to work at the time with the with the Paperboy track, like I was saying. So I tried it on here. I might have even adjusted that. I don't know. Um, um, size uh, 211. Don't really know. Can't really explain that. Just as it is, width full. So we're using the reverb to the full potential of its width. And then we've got a little bit of dampening on the top and the bottom end there, some low cutting and high cutting. And just quite a modest mix, 30%. Yeah, it just puts the sound in its place. Yeah, so that's the, that's the build-up sound. And then here is just like this little kind of uh, dong sound which to me sounded like someone dying in an old Mega Drive game or uh, maybe maybe even uh, Master System. I can't remember what the generation of sound was at that time with the soundboards, but yeah. A real simple no kind of processing on it. No EQ, nothing, just the right sound. Um, don't, I guess what I'm saying here is don't try and, oh, no, are we? No, that's, sorry, that was muted, so that isn't on there. Just make sure. Yeah, no, it definitely wasn't on there. So I tried to put something on there, as you can see, and it didn't work for me, so I just stopped straight away, left it as it was. And I think that is the transition there, the only other transition on the intro. It's a quick sort of soundscape. Okay, bass, I think, next. It looks like it's coming in. So this bass line, uh, is two synths to create the sound. The first sound. Let's get a nice moment of that chair. Look at it. Okay, so that's the that's the sort of layer of the bass kind of character on its own. There's no sub with that. Um, when I'm using massive, I tend to just make the sound. If I'm making bass, I'll I'll, I'll kind of uh, won't worry about layering a sub with it until I'm ready to. If you know what I mean, I don't think right now. Let's put a sub with it. That that never happens. Um, I like to try and get the sound as fat as possible without a separate sub, um, and then cut away. So. Uh, what have I used for this? I've used the the basic um, selection of wavetables, the in, in harmonic wavetable. 
And we're only using one oscillator, so it's real simple. We are, okay, so I think that number seven applies to either this or this. And I think machine, uh, sorry, Native Instruments Y, didn't you make this a slightly different color to this? It's very difficult for us colorblind folk, you know? Um, I can't tell the difference between yellow and green, but I think this might be to do with this macro. I'm just gonna check. No, it's not. It's to do with this. So if I turn that off. That's basically making that LF, that um, performance uh, navigate the wavetable position on the synth by doing it like this in a quarter note um, LFO, a quarter note rate, sorry, one over four. You know, if I change this, so you can get a nice variation. Okay, you can get nice variation like that, but I just wanted to get a fundamental flow working. And I always work with the oscillator first. I know it sounds obvious, but some people start jumping to filters before they've even decided if they're putting any more oscillators on. Just saying, um, you know, start start with these guys and move down to these guys and then head over to the uh, to the filters and then carry on after that. That's the best way. Um, as I said, this is pretty simple. There's no other stuff going on in this chain of stuff. There's no, nothing's on at all. So we can move over to filters. Uh, we're using a double notch. Let's turn that off. Also, it's worth mentioning we're, we're running in series mode on the... Uh, on the filter there. Okay, so we're running into filter one, then into filter two, and then continuing down here and so on. Um, yeah, you can separate that by using this and then using the mix of your oscillators here to choose which the signal path it takes. Um, no resonance on the filter, just a little bit of modulation going on again with uh, an LFO this time, so more modulation happening from the LFO section, not the performance mode as we did over here. Um, LFO 5 is not synced, it's just doing its thing as far as I can see. Yeah, just on a sine wave. Let's just see what happens if we adjust this. Okay, so anarchy starts to come in and we're getting self oscillating. Yeah, not ideal. So you've got to kind of, it probably took me a while to tweak that to where I needed it to be. Sounds right. Um, amp, amp is taken down a little bit on it as well, so I've sort of softened the amount of modulation that's actually going on by adjusting that a little bit. But that's pretty much it for that kind of filter. And then we've got another filter here, um, which is on a band pass. Okay, so that's that's really the sound that we've got all the way down this process until we've got to this, and then this is shaping it and we're using performance mode number seven like we did on the wavetable position we're using it on the cutoff for the for the filter and that's kind of cool I like to kind of use a couple of modulators to do several different things in the synthesizer and you should try that um, if you're not already definitely definitely worth experimenting with and Massive's a real easy one to do it with Serum's another good one Serum uh, by Zephyr Records uh, I've actually done preset banks for both of them, so uh, go and check those out. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where we're at with the filters on and everything. We've got quite a lot of modulation going on on number seven there on the on the cutoff on filter two. The bandwidth isn't being modulated, but it's set. Let me just, uh, I don't know, I don't know if people are interested, Cubase users might be interested. It's got an A and B switch here, which means you've essentially got two of the same plugin and you can compare very easily by just jumping from one to another. So nice little tip there. If you didn't know about that, I'm just going to jump to B and edit this a little bit. So I'm going to change the bandwidth. And as you might have guessed, it's changing the sound considerably. And that's basically sort of like homing in on where the filtration is actually taking place uh, with, the, with the band pass. Not a lot of resonance 
going on at all, none at all there. No resonance on either of the filters, which is kind of not traditional for me. Sometimes I'll use the resonance to push the sound, um, push f sort of um, to get it a bit ruder, actually. You can of often get quite a rude sound with resonance and uh, get it a little bit protruding. Um, I think I've explained those right. So uh, at this process, then I'll start looking at the root, uh, the voicing we haven't looked at. So we've got three unison running on the voice in there, uh, which means that there's three voices making up this sound. If I take that down to one, it's a very different sound. That's three. That's one. Still sounds okay, but three was just richer for me. Um, we're using the pitch cut off a little bit. So that's kind of, it's giving it character. I think I literally just put it on and moved the knob there, to be honest with you. Moved the slider and then that was it. Like, moved it about a little bit, found a place I liked and stuck with it. It's polyphonic. That means I can play, oh, when it wants to actually play. I don't know why my keyboard keeps doing this. I need to buy a new keyboard. This has served me very well, but so for those that don't know, polyphonic means you can play more than one key, i.e. more voices. If we had that in monophonic, you can only play one key at once, so <laughs> um, I'm going to keep it where it was and that's it. I'm not doing anything else. Everything else is turned off. Uh, the trigger is on, always trigger. Yeah pretty much pretty much everything that's going on. I'm um, just looking at the vibrato now. There is a vibrato um, macro there, but we're not using it. And the time is just, the, the glide is on the time is just set traditionally where it usually is. Okay, so at this point, then I'll, um, I'll move into the routing section, actually. And this can be a bit of a gray area for some people. They don't necessarily know what this is. And I didn't for a little while, but it's quite simple. Really, it's to let you know where you can insert these guys where you can actually put these in the signal chain these two guys also the feedback you can put that in a few different places as well if you're using it you can see them there fb fb uh, there's another one there um, yeah so it's quite important because we're using a sign shaper in the insert one you've got a selection different type of stuff and i'm using the macros to kind of well I say I'm using them, I've got them both at zero, but I was probably experimenting with the macros, trying to sort of like, just turn them without actually turning the fundamental um, dials here. Sometimes I get very kind of funny about committing and I don't like to turn these, so I like to put the macros on to turn them so I can always get them back to zero where they were. And it's important to do that. Don't You don't ever want to lose the starting point of when you started tweaking the sound, if you can help it. That's why that A and B really helps as well. When I'm, when I'm doing this copying from A and B, it means that I've got one that's as it was, and then one that can be whatever I want it to be, changed or, or go wrong with or whatever. Um, so let's have a look at what that's doing when I turn it on and off. So it's really bringing out the harmonic content in the uh, top end and distorting it. That's where a lot of the sound's coming from. Without that, the sound falls apart. See, um, the drive settings are set pretty pretty heavily. It's also worth noting that it's actually here in the signal chain. If I put this over here, okay, so that's before the filter. We've just moved the instance of the insert one to before the filter one. We can put it here. Slightly different sound, and then we can put it here and get our harmonic distortion, which is what I was after. It's being driven almost to a point where it will not sound nice, but you know, go there, maybe dial back a little bit, experiment with it. Then the last kind of things I've done are just these final kind of finalizations on this this part, and this is I don't ever get to this part until the very end, really of the sound and rightly so you can kind of see the way that the way that massive actually is is created it looks like it's all disjointed from each other you see that the way i'm hovering the mouse there so this is right at the end and we've just got a bit of tube saturation going on that's without it so bringing 
that quite a lot. More distortion. So let me, uh... It's not actually distorting on the channel though. You see there. It's nice and got plenty of headroom. So you're, you're, I'm attaining the distortion on purpose. I'm not driving the plug into within a light in, inch of a life of itself. And it's running native as well, so I can tweak it any time. That's important for me. And that's pretty much, I think, that sound explained. I don't think I did anything else. Oh, EQ. Okay, yeah, slight little bit of interesting stuff going on in the EQ here. Uh, more, mod, more modding going from LFO 5, so more modulation here, here. And the number 7 is doing the high pass, or the high shelf, sorry, um, right at the top. I turn this EQ off. So we're just getting a little bit of extra movement. If I turn it on, really subtle. Yeah. So that's basically the sound. Um, we've got an Omnicide running on there. Let's turn that off. Okay, so that was the sound I had. And Omnicide's just bringing out a bit of kind of distortion. And again, you could use any distortion unit. Omnicide's a multi-band distortion, but yeah, I used that one particular for this, for just to stick on there at the end. And it was a preset, it wasn't a no big deal. Um, good. Underneath that is a sub running. Yeah, that's just in Massive. Um, and it's a very, very simple process making a sub in Massive. You just select the sine square or the sine triangle, anything that's got a sine in it. Um, and I've got that selected all the way over on the uh, on the left there. Uh, no processing on it, actually. Sometimes I might put a little bit of drive on it. You know, you could... Uh, sometimes I like to... Maybe something like that. So subtle. But I haven't in this case, so that's going to stay off. Uh, and then on that we've got a compressor on the insert there, and that's set up as a side chain with a ghost kick, which is here. Now this ghost kick has got no output, it's just literally, um, it's, li it's literally only making the process but no actual sound. If I press play here, you can see that there's, the, the side kick is, is sending the audio process but no sound's getting out. And that's because I've set it to no track, it's got, it's got no output. Uh, but what it is doing is it's set up to work off the massive sub, so it ducks it a little bit when the kick comes in. And you can just about hear it, that's that's when it's happening. Whenever the sub's in and that, that processing's going on, that means that the kick is ducking it out. When if I engage the actual kick, there, you can hear it then. So that's just ducking that signal out a little bit to make room for the kick and make sure that the sub, because the kick had quite a lot of low elements in it. And rather than cut those out, I like to get the same thing. It's exactly the same as well, exactly the same kick and make that trigger the compressor at the same time. Um, and that works for me usually. Sometimes I might need to do it on a multi-band compression um, side chain as well. That can work better if it's not working on the traditional one. But in this case, it worked fine. Um, Play all that then. Oh. Okay, so there's this little sound that comes in as a little incidental bass, and although that that guy's doing most of the heavy lifting, and that's pretty simple as well at that bass. You know, it's just it's just there, but it's very, like I say, it was inspired by crust. Um, there's, there's lots of other inspiration in there as well from the drums, but yeah, uh, it was a basic kind of weird modulated synth sound. And then I've got another one here, which is two, two massives again. Uh, let's have a look at the first layer. Okay, so I've called it Aggie as um, one. Don't know why. But a little bit more complicated this one. We've got a uh, two oscillators going on. 
and first thing I've noticed is one of them's detuned by, um, no, sorry, it's pitched up by 36. Let's see what happens when we turn just uh, the first one on. <laughs> That mixed with this one. Pretty crazy sound. Um, that's being modulated by performance mode 8 over here. Okay. And it's being negatively modulated, so it's bringing it down. You can see it moving there as I'm pressing the key. If I change this, okay, it slows down the uh, the progression of the of the uh, performance. Yeah, I set it to about four. I think that worked quite nicely. Um, what else have we got going on? Number five is modulating. Yeah, that is. So number five LFO is modulating the wavetable position of officer officer oscillator two. Um, we haven't really talked about these guys as they are. This is a sign, so one, one side of it is literally just a sign on this oscillator, um, completely on the left-hand side of the wavetable. And then this is a Milan, M Melancholia wavetable, and it's the effects chorus one, the effects chords, which I don't use very often. But that sound is definitely bringing all of the uh, presence to it. But without this one, it sounds a little bit sort of naked and empty. So I guess what am I saying here? Like, do try using oscillators into each other. Try, you know, cross modulating and um, you know mixing them a little bit different. I I happen to have both of the amp amps at full on this, um, but it just seems to work. It's, it's just seemed to fit together. Uh, what else is going on? Uh, the the spectrum mode is on the first oscillator, but in the second one I've got the pitch minus selected. I'm not really sure how to explain what this does, but it definitely gives the sound a, a slightly different touch the more you in the a dirtier sound the further you go with it. And I'm I've got that set to a macro there. I've called it Tombra. If I engage that so it's real subtle. real subtle but I, I, I ended up not using it I just didn't even have it turned on so I left it alone again putting putting these guys onto stuff to see if I want to turn it up or not rather than turning it up and just forgetting about it and forgetting it was even turned up in the first place NFO 5 we haven't really spoken properly about yet okay so what I've done is I've set up LFO 5 on the wavetable position it's a tr traditional um, saw, saw waveform and what's going on here is this is this is macros controlling the parameters of LFO5. So instead of just setting them and leaving them as they are, I've actually been tweaking them probably when I was making this. And I've got number two doing the LFO amount here, and then number three doing the speed. So I've, you can see both of those are tweaked. Uh, the LFO amount is fully up actually. But that got the desired sound that I wanted. If I just move out of this, so I'll go into the other B setting of this massive. I can change these. Okay, so that was the LFO mount. Now the speed. So quite quickly you can achieve like variation in the sound. You know, if you've got that sound in there and you wanted to do several variants, just tweaking those you could do quite fast. And I think I just left them where they were in the end because they sort of fitted the, the gap I had. Cool. Um, that's it for the oscillation mode. No kind of uh, other interesting stuff really happening there. Um, white noise is turned on but isn't engaged because the amplifier is right down. So yeah, that complete section is done. And then over here we're using the scream. Sorry, we're setting uh, series mode again. So through, through, through filter one and then through filter two. But we're not using filter two, so don't worry about that guy. Filter one is doing the scream filter. Don't really know. 
I guess it's a filter that's got some drive in the colorization is the best way I'd describe it. I don't really know a better way to describe it than that. I think that's kind of a good way of saying it. I've got the cutoff set full, but I've got several, several modulators, um, probably all doing different things. LFO5 again is doing the heavy lifting here. Um, okay, so closing the filter, you end up with a, a diminished sound. And I just left it all the way at the top. And then number four, envelope four, is controlling the, f the, f the filter cut off there as well. But because it's turned all the way up and it's greyed out, it's actually probably not really doing that much. If I actually bypass this, let's just have a look, see what happens. Okay. So it is controlling it, but like it's just an odd setting that I've got it on because you can't really see what it's doing because it's set all the way up. It's more to do with how I had these set probably. And then we've got another uh, macro here, number five, doing the filter uh, LFO cutoff. There it says. So that is actually adjusting this if I turn it down like this. See? So it's an easy way to kind of get another variation. I might have used it, but I didn't. Um, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Here I did with these LFO amounts and speeds I used it. Um, okay, so we've done all of our kind of, you know, morphing of the sound with the filters there. That's that's all that's going on. The scream is also set, it's worth noting, at about 10 o'clock. Um, if we change that. You get a different sound. Down here it's a little bit more prominent in the top end. And also some bottom end kind of clarification down there as well. Seems to thin out a little bit up there. Um, but yeah, flavour to taste, I guess, um, is what I'm saying here. And then a little bit of res to give it some character, I think. Let's try to turn that off. Yeah, so. So it gets really rude over there. But a little bit definitely goes a long way. Good, um, that's pretty much it filtering wise. Let's move down to, down here, down to the inserts and I can see I'm only using one, uh, it's the clipper. And yep, I've got a macro set on that, which again, non-destructively lets me kind of play around with it, leave it for half an hour, come back to it. I could do that with this guy as well, but say this was set here and I didn't want to move it from there, then it would really kind of be beneficial. Uh, I didn't know I ended up pushing it all the way down and just moving it over here. And then the dry wet's kind of modest, 10 o'clock. Bringing out a lot of kind of top end saturation. And I've got that after the filter here. Uh, not in this stage, after both filters, but after filter one. And it doesn't really matter if it was after filter two or, or at this stage really, because filter two isn't being used. So it wouldn't really be applicable anyway. Um, just after filter one is fine. If I put it before filter one. Okay. More of a top end sort of feel. And that's a little bit duller because obviously the filter one's taken out the harmonics of the distortion. Cool. And then let's check the voicing out. No unison. And we've got... That's not doing anything because it's not even moving off the mono side. So we are using it monophonic, but this guy was obviously me having a little bit of a moment thinking, do I need to do this or not? And in the end, I just decided not to turn it off and probably just left it. As you can see, as I turn it on and off, it's not, it's not doing anything. Uh, routing's done. So the last things are just the effects. Let's turn all of these guys off and see what it sounds like. Wow. So we've got a tube giving it giving it some balls, you know, a little bit of aggression. That's on, that's off. Um, I'm using, interestingly, I'm using a macro to control the drive on the clip insert one, and also the drive on the on the Brauner tube um, insert there. And they're both set to similar kind of levels so that I could use one macro to, to affect both of those parameters at the same time and achieve the same driven sort of effect from both 
of the plugins in Massive. And then the, the, the dry wet's just sort of nine o'clock, kind of modest, not too much. And that just works. And then we've got a dimension expander, which is a great kind of uh, master effect in Massive. Let's put it on. And that's basically giving it that sort of stereo field shadow, I like to kind of call it, you know, like a small, very small reverb, but not, uh, it's difficult to describe, but it, it really fits the sound and the stereo image better. Also probably giving it quite a lot of stereo. Um, that is being adjusted. I've got a macro doing the dry wet here. Okay. So that's none. And that's where it was. Uh, and then an EQ. Quite a top end boost. That's with it. And that's with it without it. Difference is night and day, really. But instead of, you know, you could EQ this sound in Cubase, but why do that when you can just use the EQ? It's perfectly good enough. And, uh, oh, the vibrato is doing something in this guy. Okay, so we've got the vibrato is being uh, is being modulated here on macro one. If I take that off. It's just adding a little bit of anarchy to it. That's a, that's a sort of un vibrato sound. And then if I go all the way up, it's got a little bit of kind of, it's almost like it's shuddering. But it's subtle. The, the parameters are set pretty kind of modest. And then um, I've got the glide being adjusted a little bit. I've, I've set the glide all the way down. And then I've put a macro on the time there so that I can just push it up a little bit. Very kind of subtle stuff, but yeah, that's kind of it. And then there's a sub running in the, underneath that as well. Let's have a look at that, just make sure there's not anything. Wow, it does sound a bit odd. Now, something interesting about this sub, which is different to the last one actually, which is important to talk about, and this is pitch modulation. Now, we were pitch modulating on this guy. We were pitch modulating with uh, Performer 8. So I've done the same thing on the sub, so to make sure that the sub follows the sound, wh whatever it does pitch-wise. And uh, the same thing applies, I've just got a quarter note ratio, um, 1 over 4, and it's, it's set exactly the same as the original sound, and the, I, I make the sub behave the same. So you can hear that. That's like the sub derivative. If I play them together, they'll be they'll mimic each other exactly. It's like some sort of drunken computer game character. Yeah, that's that sound done then. That's it. Um, let's move on to the next thing I can see coming in is looks like another massive. Use a lot of massive for this tune. This is another little kind of quick sub, I think. Yeah, so this guy is homing on him a little bit so that I can uh, loop it. Okay, I'm not going to make it too intense. Okay, if I move that, that means it will start there every time. So this is another massive. Uh, it's got no bottom end in it. All the bottom end's been taken out, probably on an EQ. Um, uh, Fab Filter Pro Q. Oh, it's doing a little bit of side, mid-side processing. Well, side, actually, specifically. Um, I'll get to that. Well, I'll, I'll talk about it now. Uh, basically, I'm just pushing the sides of the sound there, not the mid. Um, this is mid-side processing, so instead of affecting the whole sound, I've decided to kind of just push the top end of the sides out a little bit more. Just just a little bit, made it a little bit more prominent there. And uh, it just worked for me. Let's listen to it with and without. Real subtle. Uh, but that's all I wanted. I just, I just, just wanted to push it and make it a little bit wider, just in that frequency range on the sides. And then uh, the sound is another simple one, uh, very quick, probably me just literally 
opening massive to get a uh, to, to get something to fit in there because I had the fundamental base. I just have a little bit of fun with these guys and pretty much make them on the fly. I've used carbon as the as the oscillator type. Um, sounds quite slow. The reason it, the reason it's fast in this, I think, is because of the way. Yeah, I've played some notes very real quickly. Yeah. Um, let's look at the actual sound. I've called it inchy. Ooh. Carbon is being modulated by not by any of the actual LFOs or performance modes this time, but by envelope three. You can see it there, the threes are doing the wavetable position and the intensity, which is set to bend plus minus. Now, bend plus minus means that uh, if you have it set at 12 o'clock, it's, it's, it's not being affected by neither bend. Um, if you have it on the left, it will be plus. Sorry, if you have it on the left, it will be minus, And if you have it on the right, it will be plus bend okay and you can choose either one but you can have both on the same fader which is quite can, can prove interesting results um, let's see what happens when we turn these off okay so straight away different sound just sounds okay but I prefer it with that movement going on just sounds a bit more interesting and that's really that's really very much it for the uh, oscillation stage, I just did some band reject filtering um, on the next filter, which does definitely have a change to the sound. Let's just turn the uh, modulation off of this and see what it sounds like. Okay, we put number three on the cutoff, number five on the bandwidth a little bit. And then number three again on the bandwidth as well. And all the subtle changes just bring out the harmonic difference in it compared to how it was before and after. And it's just it's just about putting them on and trying them out. Um, this guy isn't doing a lot, I don't think. Um, but again, it's just being it's just modulating it a little bit as well. So cross modulation between two different types of modulators is proves interesting results. Uh, resonance is set to the root setting. Let's just try taking that down a bit. Okay, so it sounds just, it just sounds really dead there. So it's really bringing out the whole body of the sound, really. Without the resonance, it's, uh, it's not really very much at all. No inserts, so no worries about checking the routing. Let's check the voicing. Nothing going on voicing-wise. And nothing going on in the oscillation. It's a real simple sound, really. The last things I added were just a chorus. And the dimension, and this is where the chorus is just another, you know, stereo kind of plug in, just giving it some stereo, widening it a little bit, giving it some dimension, really. Yeah, sounds very kind of one dimensional about it. And then dimension expander again, just even reinforcing the chorus as a backup. Not as a backup, that's the wrong word, just they're both working together to make the sound what it is. And then some EQ, very little kind of uh, light shelving of the top end. And that's that little sound complete. And again, it's got its own sub running independently right beneath it. Let's just listen to that. Yeah, real simple. Next, I'd, at this point, I added in some little uh, extra percussion. I had, I had all of this kind of stuff in and it was all working great, but I'd, I'd, I needed to add some candy to my ears just to roll the track along a little bit as well and give it, give it some sort of progression so it wasn't just the same. So I added, uh, what's this? Let's have a look. Okay. This is a, a house loop, believe it or not, I think, and it's got a gator on it. Okay, so that's with the gator, without the gator, sorry. Yeah, Gator Pro, very simple kind of thing to try out and use. And it's just 
taken the whole thing and just, you know, taken down the decay and the sustain of the whole sample a little bit. Yep. And um, a little bit of low cut on that. Just a little bit of low cut EQ. That's with, without it. So just add in a little bit of shuffle, a little bit more groove at that 41, 41 bars there into the track. So in between 33 and 49, right sort of, you know, in the middle of all of that, I'm just adding a little extra groove just to push it along a little bit, I think. Uh, there's another little guy that comes in here. I think it's this one. Again, I think that is a loop, probably a house loop that's just been timed up for drum and bass. Uh, we've got a reverb on that. Let's get that loop so I can actually hear it. Without the reverb. Okay, it's pretty tight, there's no pre-delay on it. Um, I think I've, I think I use the 0.3 sort of setting quite a lot. About nine o'clock. Um, it's quite a modest kind of short reverb. Size of 65, diffusion width. These are kind of just been set personally for this type of reverb. Sometimes I have the width at full, like I did earlier. Um, we are we are also kind of just dampening the bottom and the top end of this reverb a little bit. And with the mix is set at 30 percent. Yeah, that's it with it, and that's with, without it. And it just worked at that point, just link in like a little sort of transition. Um. It filled a space, so to speak. Um. Okay, so here's another kind of house loop, similar to the other one. What have I done to this? Stereo enhancer, okay. But stereo enhancers are interesting um, <clears throat> in the fact that you should use them to, well, I, I use them to widen stuff, but I also use them to narrow and make stuff narrower when it's too wide. Um, when you load it up initially, the stereo wider in Cubase is like that, set at 100, and it won't be doing anything. It will neither be widening nor narrowing, which is what you want it to do. You know, some plugins color straight away but that's why I like this one it doesn't do anything when you put it on okay and you can get a kind of little bit of a representative for what the actual you know frequency range is doing um, as regards to the stereo image there so you can see there's a bit in there and all I did was took it down so that I was just getting a smaller amount of stereo information it was being pushed more into the middle really important a lot of people's stuff I listen to on demos and also clients I have with my tuition, um, their stuff is too wide, or sometimes it's not wide enough. And this is the plugin you want to try using, or a plugin similar to the Cubase one that can do this job. And they're out there, you know. That's without it. Weird. Yeah, just bringing it in a little bit. Okay, and uh, here the intro is coming back in, just to kind of for a split second of transition here. The intro is back in, um, and then we're back over here. Slightly different version of this bass. I've made a copy of it, so that's, that's the red one. There's a few. There's a few MIDI changes as well in the track, which I haven't really gone into too much detail on because they don't. They're not really kind of. You know, don't really need any teaching about them. But what uh, I have done here is made a, a different type of massive here. I've copied this one probably and made a different type of sound with it. Now I think if I put that up here, it won't sound as good. 
Right, good. I'm glad that just happened because that's that shows me because I couldn't think for a sec. Why did I do a copy? That's exactly why. The way that that this behaves, this this massive behaves to the other one is slightly different, and you can see that from when I tried to change the MIDI there, and just put it on this one. I don't know what the difference is, and it could take me a while to find, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But the fact of the matter is, is that I changed the sound a little bit just to uh, just to have that variant in there, you know, just to just so it wasn't the same again. Um, I thought I might be able to find it, but you can hear the difference when I move the MIDI there. <laughs> So that's how I wanted it to sound, and if I'd kept it on the original Massive... It didn't quite work right, I wanted it to be different from that, so that's why I made a difference there. There's also another Massive here, which is... This, this is kind of like a real kind of toned down, subdued version of, uh, of this one. Okay, so you can hear there, it's not really got much signal about it at all. And that's just riding over the original sub still. Just giving it a little bit of character if I put the sub in. Without it. So just a little bit of filthiness really. Uh, yeah, and that is the same, that's that. It's the preset just subdued a little bit. What have I done? Can I see if I can find out what I've done? Uh, a little bit processing on this side, yeah it's just the same, <coughs> just subdued a little bit probably on the filter and I think that is, we are pretty much getting to the end of the track, there's a little guy down here, a blue guy, let's see what that's doing, okay so it's like a submarine kind of sound and that's just a little transition at the end of the bar there between 63 and 65. I just like the sound of it. I chucked it in there and it, it just worked for me as a little... It's only in there once, do you know what I mean? Throughout the whole of the tune, it's just in there once. I do that a lot. You can see there, there's, there's little sounds dotted about all over the place and I miss that in a lot of music. Like It used to be a lot more like that in drum bass. People put those incidentals in and today it feels like a lot of people don't bother with that anymore. <laughs> A little quick effect there, 170 effect that I've probably, uh, whoops, I've probably sort of timed that up a little bit. Yeah, you can see that it says 170. So in Cubase, you get the option to the musical mode is really good. Up here it says musical mode. If you turn that off, that was the sound as it was before I processed it with Cubase. Okay, which is cool. But I squashed it all together with the musical mode <coughs> and made it sound like this. A real quick kind of in and out. You can go into musical mode here and actually turn it on off in the audio edit window and it does the same thing. Um, the other good thing you can do is you can change the amount of bars that you want it to occupy. So let's say we wanted to make it a bit longer, just put it to two bars. And you can get that a little bit of a longer sound. Four bars will give you even longer and then so on, you know. And I really like that. It's, that's nice and quick and easy to kind of get a result with. Change sounds, use sounds. Um, differently to what they were intended, I guess, and that definitely wasn't supposed to be pushed together like that, I don't think, this sound. Cool. Any EQing or anything on that? No, nothing at all. Just left completely as is. Um, okay. Okay, there's a little sound there. A lot of incident was in this tune. Make that a little bit of a bigger loop, I don't want to... It's like a little digital laser beam. Again, no processing on it, just a one-shot sample. Um, this guy here. 
Sounds like a something opening and shutting almost. I don't think there's anything on that either. Again, I'm just choosing the samples that I like, and if they fit, they work. I don't do a lot of processing to them. They tend, to, if you can find the good ones, effect-wise, one shots, they they tend to just work. What you usually do is just put. What I usually do is just put a little bit of musical mode on them to see if that works or not. And in this case, it was too quick, and it was just fine as it was. And I think that's all of the elements pretty much explained. Yeah, I can't see any others, or hear any others. I don't think there's a. There's there is one here on the. It's like a little crash sound here, like a almost like an impact. Let's have a look at that. Can I do anything to that? No. A little bit of low cut and high cut, <coughs> rolling off the the bottom end at 21 hertz, so real low stuff, probably not even audible. Definitely not audible. And 1.8k on the top end, I'm rolling off. What is that for? That's just literally just a, a sample I found. Didn't need any kind of reverb or anything on it, just worked straight away as it is. And I think that is the track complete. Uh, the only thing really I haven't looked at is the master bus, I think. Just gonna have a look at these. I've got some I've got some buses here that I don't think they've got anything on the intro sounds, yeah. That was just a level thing. Uh bass wise. Okay, I've got a sidewinder and I'm just doing a very modest kind of mid-range boost on the bass bus. <coughs> Hardly audible. I'm using the sidewinder again. Just to take it out of that mono realm and just give it a little bit of information there. So that's really it for all the elements, I think. Um, don't, don't think there's anything I've missed out. The rest is just the master bus, I think, that's getting used. Let's have a look at that. So I'm just using a Pro L in this one. Okay. And yeah, it's, it's squashing it pretty hard, but the, the mix of the actual track inside it is, uh, it's nicely, the levels are quite low. Look, everything's got its headroom. So I'm squashing it quite a lot at the end there. Okay, tack and release is set to kind of my normal kind of things. These might I might adjust these a little bit from time to time um, if I'm not getting the desired sound, but generally tend to leave them alone unless I need to do anything with them. Um, I'll turn that off. Yeah. That's, that's pretty much what I've got on the mass of this. That does vary. Sometimes I have a lot more on there. I have up to sometimes four plugins on there. I just, for this track, it didn't need it. Or maybe I was at the stage where I just wanted to get a quick mix done and get it down and it, it just worked. I played it out, uh, went in and adjusted a couple of things and that was it. That was, that was the end of the track, pretty much. I don't tend to write, it varies actually. Sometimes I'll write with Pro L on or maybe um, Ozone I've used before. Um, sometimes I have nothing and actually have all of the levels riding up quite a lot higher than this, a lot higher, because um, it's all going through the, it's all going through the master bus and it's in the red. And it's quite an interesting concept. Like I see a lot of people, I was watching a, a video earlier about how someone just can't have anything in the red. But um, for me, if it sounds good, then really, um, if it sounds good, just go for it. Um, I've found that sometimes when I've been pushing everything in the red, and I used to make all my tunes in the red actually um, a long time ago, I was getting that saturation of all the, all the sounds going in together and that was the sound. As soon as I turned everything down, I lost the, the, 
the sound. I lost I lost that little bit of colour that I was getting of everything being pushed. So as much as everyone might like to say, oh, you know, you shouldn't work in the red or don't let it clip, it's, there's kind of another side to that um, that a lot of people won't even acknowledge. Um, and in drum and bass, I'm a living proof that you can actually do that and, and, and come up with a good result. So yeah, that's kind of it for today with uh, the track and everything. And uh, thanks for kind of following me and watching me. Uh, if you're interested in tuition with me, as I uh, am doing tuition exclusively one-to-one -one at the moment, um, you can email me heist1to1s at gmail.com and we will talk further about that. But uh, for now, thanks to Future Music and yeah, it's been fun. Catch you next time.